In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Corona Pola, blessed feast day, on this wonderful feast of the twelve holy apostles of the Lord. Especially, I extend my greetings to all those who are, have the name Apostolos, Apostolia, who celebrate their names day this day. In the Divine Liturgy, at the very end, I just came out and read a prayer uh, in front of the icon of Christ, which includes the following words. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from you, the Father of lights. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from you, the Father of lights. In this beautiful prayer, which the fathers of our church call the summary of the whole divine liturgy, and especially in these few words, we see the reality of things that are and also the nature of things that are yet to come. Because every good thing that we have in this life comes from God. It's not from our own. Even the things that we may seem to achieve through our own efforts and our own strength, even those things come from God, let alone the things that we have no power over. And where do these things come from? They come from God's very hand Himself, and from the kingdom of heaven. And this kingdom of God, which God willing we will enter into after our deaths and in, in the next life that is to come, we will enter into this kingdom altogether as one family, as one Christian family, uh, is the place where everything good exists, where there is nothing evil, where there is no uh, blemish and no spot and no wrinkle, where there is only beautiful and good. Uh, and all these things come, of course, from being united to our Lord and Savior. In that kingdom, when we go there, we will experience all of these blessings, all of these uh, energies of God, and all of these good things firsthand. We will experience them in their fullness, and they will be unlike anything that we have ever experienced before. Imagine all the good things that we are able to experience here on earth. The things in heaven will be exponentially greater. They will be so far beyond what we've experienced so far that uh, it may be like a sensory overload when we get there, and it may be very hard for us to even stand it, being there in heaven with God. The things in heaven will not be like the things on earth. The things on earth uh, perish and go away. The things, on heaven, the things in heaven will remain. The experience of earthly pleasures here on earth diminish over time. But in heaven, they will only increase and multiply. And we will experience God in a new way every single day that passes. Even though, of course, in heaven there is no time. I use it as a phrase. As, as every... every uh, as we go on, our experience of God will become greater and greater, and it will be new and exciting at every turn. We get to taste these things here in this life. The blessings of heaven, the eternal joy, the uh, comfort, the rest, the pleasure of being in heaven. We get to taste them here on earth. We get to taste them in listening to a beautiful piece of music. We get to taste them literally in a well-prepared food and dishes, you know, that we get to taste and eat. We get to experience God's blessings and His eternal blessings in our family life and in our connections and in the love that we experience between one another. And all of these things are good and direct us back to our Lord and Savior. We know that these things come from God because they lead us back to God. We know these things come from God because they inspire in our hearts glory and thanksgiving for Him who gave them to us. We know these things are from God because they fill our hearts with joy and love, not only for those around us, but for our Creator and Maker, the Father above who sends down every good thing from heaven. But there are also in this life false pleasures. There are also in this life false joys and false hopes 
that arise from other things that exist in this world. These types of pleasures and joys do not lead us back to God. They come from a selfishness. They come from a self-centeredness and a constant desire to appease our senses and to please ourselves in various ways. These types of joys, these false joys, these false hopes and false pleasures lead us not to God but away from God and back to ourselves in our own hearts. These types of joys do not remain new and exciting over time, but they lose and diminish their flavor. And the sweet taste maybe that we taste in the beginning goes away, and what is left is only bitterness. These false joys that we maybe would call the vices in some Christian circles are very dangerous for us. especially in the light of the times that we live in. The times that we live in where uh, these things are becoming normalized, where these things are becoming mainstream, where these vices, where these false joys and hopes are being propagated as ways to fill your life and to become the people that you are supposed to be and to become your best self and to uh, be happy and to be joyful, but in the end they will only leave us empty because there's no godliness in them. We live in a time when these false joys and false pleasures are passed as uh, as things that are good. And we fall into those traps believing that we are doing ourselves a favor by indulging our passions. But nothing could be farther from the truth. We see this, we saw this very clearly recently here in our own state of Illinois, which passed a new law which will legalize uh, recreational marijuana use in this state. And regardless of your political affiliation and whatever your political beliefs may be, I think it's important for us as Orthodox Christians, which reaches higher and beyond any political stance we may have to understand what the church teaches about these kinds of things, about drug use and about other things like that, and to know that we stand firmly against them, no matter what the state and whatever, no matter what our country may say. The question we have to answer, however, is why? Why does the church say no, even when the state says yes? And I think that's the important thing to understand. I remember having a conversation with a young boy, he must have been a teenager, before I was ordained a priest, I was just a layperson at the time, who had uh, been using marijuana for some time. And I had a conversation with him about it. And he asked me, what's so bad about marijuana? What's so bad about using marijuana? And the reality is that uh, for us, you know, for us, uh, I won't share with you, uh, that, that was a private conversation, I don't want to share with you that, what, the advice that I gave him. But in a nutshell, uh, for us the issue with these things is not so much the, the physical uh, damage that may be done or not done. It may not, it's not the merit of the activity itself or anything like that. It's that we train ourselves to appreciate and seek out and love and uh, attach ourselves to these activities that have no godliness in them, that have no God in them, where God is absent. And we, we train ourselves to prefer them to the activities and the energies and the joys that lead us back to God. That's the problem. That's the big issue. Is that in these things, whether they're harmful or not, in these things, whether they're uh, physically detrimental or not, They take our hearts away from God and they put them into something else. In the Old Testament, that's called idolatry. For us, that's an ugly word that may be hard to digest. But when we take our heart and give it to something other than the Lord, that is a definition of idolatry. And that's why for us, uh, these types of things, whether it be 
uh, drug use or whether it be whatever. I mean, think of how many things have become normal now in our society where in the past they were not. Drug use, uh, pornography, which is rampant in our times, uh, premarital relations between couples, whatever it may be, millions of things now that passions and vices that people get into. All of these things have the same result. It's that they pull us away. It's that they pull our hearts away from God and we train ourselves and get ourselves used to seeking those things out instead of seeking uh, the things that will bring us back to Him. It's a choice that people are making to choose death instead of life. Because these hobbies, as people call them, or habits or whatever it may be, in the end are empty. There's nothing in them. Because God's not there. Eventually, they go away, right? There's, there's nothing left at the end. Because only God is eternal. And only if we fill God, ourselves with God and His love and His Spirit will we be eternal as well. And that's the danger. The danger is that we will fill our, thing, our, our lives, our bodies, our minds, and our souls with things that are temporary, with things that will be done away with at the end times, and that even for ourselves, there will be nothing left. The extreme end of this is that as time goes on, uh, you know, we either you use these substances, we use whatever it may be, we have our vices that we give ourselves over to, and in, over time, the enjoyment of them becomes very small. It, the, it goes away. The excitement, the newness of it, it goes away. But our dependence on them becomes very great. And so we have something that we don't even enjoy anymore, and yet we need it because we're dependent on it. And this is a form of slavery, spiritual slavery, where we have something that owns us that we can't break away from. And yet, again, our society pitches these things to us as things that will free us, that will illumine us, that will help us grow, that will make us progress, and it's all a delusion. I, forgive me for using such strong language, but I feel very passionately about this, in that a lot of people are walking towards the cliff, and they don't realize it because our society tells them the cliff is the road, but it's not. It's really not. Whether you yourself struggle with these vices or not is really irrelevant because someone in your life does. There's someone in your life that, whether it be your children, whether it be your grandchildren, whether it be co-workers and their families, whether it be your neighbors, there are people who will come in contact with these challenges. And we, as the church, have to be able to hold the line. Even if they choose to live differently, we have to hold the line uh, to show and bring God's energies and God's activity into the world, to bring His light and life and joy and pleasure, which is eternal and not temporary, which is ever renewing and not diminishing, which is a resurrection and not a death. We have to bring that into this world. So I hope and pray as we go on, as we go forth from our church today into our homes and in our lives, that we will consider uh, not only what our politicians say, but also what our church teaches. That we will consider the things that are important not only to our state, but also to our Lord. And we'll consider them and put those things in our hearts and we'll remain pure temples of the Holy Spirit. Because this is what God requires of us. If we want the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in us, he asks us to remain a pure temple for His Spirit. I hope and pray that God, through His apostles, who suffered and went through their own crosses in a way, to, in order to enter into that eternal life, that life of blessedness and true joy uh, in the kingdom of heaven, that we will be inspired by them and get their intercessions and prayers so that we may always stay strong, so that we may always overcome our temptations and our passions and our vices, and so that we may one day enter into that eternal and never-ending joy and blessing and pleasure of our Lord and Father who sends down every good thing from above. Amen.